Egypt. So last week, um, uh, Lydia preached on uh, Jerusalem, and um, today um, I'm preaching um, on Egypt. So Egypt's a really um, interesting, uh, interesting uh, land in the Bible, and uh, it's one which is spoken, out, spoken about throughout Scripture, and it sort of forms this, um, this really uh, strange kind of a place. Um, the next slide. If, um, it's, it's, it's both a place of oppression in the Bible, and then it's a place of hope. But often when we read in our Bible, we only think of Egypt as a place of oppression where the Israelites spent those, um, those 400 years as slaves uh, in the Scripture. But it is really uh, significant. So what I want to do today is kind of do a little sweep of the Old Testament into the New Testament, looking at what happens with Egypt, looking at some key characters who interacted in the land of Egypt, and try to glean and draw um, so, some lessons um, from that. So just to give you a story, a little bit of like, how did Egypt, how did it all come, come to pass? So um, we read in scripture that um, uh, after man and woman were created, um, the people started to be bad, didn't they? There was just evil on their hearts continually. And God um, spoke to Noah and asked Noah to build an ark. And Noah built the ark. And then um, him and his, uh, his wife and his three sons, they were saved. And civilization started again. Now, Noah had three sons, um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham um, actually was one of those who went out and his sons into... He, one of his sons was called Egypt, and he went out into um, the land of Egypt. Genesis 10, 6 says, The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. And they're like different places um, in the Old Testament. And we see that you've got this story of like, um, these different nations which come from Noah's descendants. And then we start to hear the story of how this interaction happens. And the first character we read about is uh, Abraham. So Abraham was called by God. Uh, he was in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. And he was called by God to, to go to a place he didn't know. But he was going to be led uh, by God on a journey. So God had a plan for Abraham. And God leads Abraham on this journey. So Abraham is traveling uh, on this journey. He's following what God has told him to do. And there is a famine in the land. And uh, Abraham is, is, is wondering, what do I do next? What, what, what do I have to do? So he knows um, that there is not a famine in Egypt. So he goes to Egypt. And he takes his family and his livestock and his, his servants. And they all go to Egypt. Now, just before Abraham gets to Egypt he realises that his wife, Sarah, is a bit hot. And that the... I'm allowed to say that, aren't I? <laughs> but he realises his wife is beautiful and he's worried that the Egyptians will take his wife off him. So he has this great idea that he's going to say that his wife is his sister. Now, he wasn't completely lying because they both had the same father um, called Haran. Um, so they go into Egypt and like he thought, the Egyptians, when he comes in, um, the Egyptians see Sarah and they're like, hmm, look at this woman. So they go and tell Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, I want to take uh, Sarah into my wife. So they're into my wife, into, as my wife. So, they're, so you, there you've got Abraham traveling, and you've got this place called Egypt, and this place called Egypt is his place of hope, his place where he can get fed, his place where he can escape from starvation, and I want you to think of these themes as we go through, and a place of safety. So he goes into Egypt with that in mind. But then, um, but then Pharaoh takes his wife because Moses, um, because Moses, because Abraham had said that he was his sister, or she was his sister. And then we, what we have is that um, we have that uh, Abraham is there um, in Egypt, and where Pharaoh has taken as his sister, all of a sudden, Pharaoh's household breaks out in a plague. Does it sound a bit familiar? Pharaoh's household breaks out in this plague. And Pharaoh realises that this woman he's taken into his house actually must be Moses' wife. And when Pharaoh has taken Moses' wife, Sarah, to be his wife, he's actually given Moses livestock, servants. He's given, he's, he's given him loads and loads of stuff, which I don't know whether Moses had to give it back afterwards. But he's given him loads and loads of stuff. And Moses, rather than trusting God, he allowed his wife to be taken by another man to be his wife. And God, in his anger, then creates this plague that happens on the house uh, of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh then casts Moses out of Egypt with Sarah. 
And it's like a foretelling of what's to come in the next story that we see later on um, in, scripture, in Scripture. But one thing we're seeing is, first of all, is that Moses could have been killed, but God delivers... Oh, sorry, Moses. I keep saying Moses, don't I? It, Abraham, isn't it? That's why you're laughing. It was a long night. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> this is going to go so bad. So, um, so, Ab- so Abraham, um, so God delivers Abraham um, through plagues and they are, they are saved from, uh, from the Egyptians. And the first, the first example, the first sort of application I want to think about is that there are so many times in life where we feel that God has given us a word or we feel that we have a promise from God or we feel that God is leading us in a specific direction and sometimes things seem not to be stacking up as we would expect them to go and therefore because the, the, the God's path that he's taken us on doesn't necessarily always follow our path we try to intervene and we try to preempt and we try to do things because we're not trusting God. In this case, Abraham was scared for his life and scared that they'd take his wife off him. So he goes and says it's his sister and creates a whole situation which is worse than the situation of trusting that God would have looked after him if God was leading him. But how often do we know that like, God has like, shared something with us or we know we're going in a direction and we know, actually, if I push the hand of God, if I intervene in this situation, maybe things will happen a little quicker or I don't trust that God will do what I need to do, whether it's in finances or work or jobs or family. But yet this is the first lesson that I want us to really think about is that often when God is leading us, a lot is not about the destination where God is taking us, but it's what he is doing in us and with us before he does something through us and to us. Do you get that? Good. Right. So Abraham gets cast out, of, um, cast out of Egypt and he carries on. He has a son called Isaac. And Isaac has um, a son called, um, well, he has two sons, um, Jacob and Esau. No, Joseph. I'm having a bad day today. So there's, <laughs> I've jumped ahead. So there's Joseph. And... Uh, <laughs> Joseph, um, Joseph is um, a, a, a son amongst his brothers, and we know the story of Joseph. Joseph's Technicolor Dreamcoat, it's a really sort of well-known story of Joseph, who was, um, who was a son. And um, Egypt was known for its wisdom, and um, Joseph's brothers um, didn't get on with Joseph. And um, Joseph was like the smart aleck of the group, and he, um, he, he felt favoured, and his, bro- his, his father favoured him, and um, gave him this coat of many colours, and, um, and looks after him more than his brothers. And his brothers get angry. On an occasion, uh, Joseph goes to see them in the fields, and they sell Joseph into slavery. They take their brother and sell their brother to a travelling gang who then take him to e- Egypt, and they sell Joseph, and he ends up in the house of Potiphar. So Joseph, Joseph's life um, had been great, and then all of a sudden... He is in slavery, not of his own doing, but he's, he's, become, a bond, he's become a bond man. He's, he's gone into bondage because his brothers hate him and his life is changed forever. And he's gone into this land where he is oppressed, where he is taken and where he, um, in Potiphar's house, his Potiphar's wife tries to, to sleep with him and he escapes and he ends up getting thrown into prison. And all of a sudden, sudden, he's gone from being this wonderful son who's loved by his father, who's who's privileged, to this prisoner in prison, in a land that he doesn't know, and in a land where he is far away from his brothers, from his mother, uh, and from his father. And uh, he then, in Egypt, is in prison, and... He actually is, Egypt's known for its wisdom and there were these, uh, these dreams that Pharaoh had about what was going to happen in Egypt and none of the wise men were able to tell the story but because of a situation where Joseph was in prison and he uh, interpreted a dream, he interprets a dream for the Pharaoh who's the king of the country and he moves from being a prisoner in prison to being the chief person, the second from Pharaoh in the land looking after all the affairs of the land and God took him from nothing to absolutely the pinnacle of where he could reach in that land. One of the key things about the story of Joseph, and one of the things that I think that we need to think about today, is that we kind of don't think about slavery anymore. 
We don't think about the impact that slavery is, happening, is having here and now, even in fish ponds, Eastern and in Bristol. And I think we read stories in the Bible and we hear about slavery and we hear about stuff going on in the world, but we don't think that actually this is happening on our doorstep. This is something as a church that we need to be praying into, something that we can't ignore and we need to think about. And I just wanted to share some statistics with you um, on slavery. I think it might be two slides on. So, number one, today more than a quarter of the world's slaves are children. More than a quarter of the slaves in the world are children. These children are forced to commit uh, commercial sex acts. They're first forced into a system of domestic servitude and employed in occupations that uh, mentally, physically and socially and morally are really harmful to them. That's a quarter of the, 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 the people who are in slavery in the world are children. That, that their start in life is being a slave. And for us who are parents, you can, think, you can imagine, like, it just breaks your heart to think that this is the life that the, these children are going into. And because we don't necessarily see it, we don't think it, but there are children out there who this is their lot. Number two. Sex trafficking is a crime when uh, women and men and children are forced to involve, be involved in commercial sex acts. Um, it's estimated that there are 4.5 million victims, 4.5 million victims of sex trafficking. Like, when we hear about it, we don't think of it in these vast numbers. These people who, like Joseph, have had all of their rights taken away from them and placed in servitude somewhere, being forced to do things that they don't want to do. It's a difficult, difficult step um, to take. And then number three, um, 2000, this is 2003 estimates, so it's, it, it's grown significantly since 2003, but only could get 2003. Um, 51 million, yeah, 51 million girls under the age of 18 uh, were forcibly married. 51 million girls, under, and that's 2003. And we sit here and we hear on the news sometimes like there's been gangs which have been busted in, in Eastern and across Bristol for sex trafficking and it, for some reason it just feels like it's something, not small, but it feels isolated. But when you start to think about what's happening across the world to so many people and you think to yourselves, are we really thinking about this? Are we praying into this? This is something that burdens and, 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 and gets in our heart. Because the story of Joseph tells us that even though this happens, that if we pray into it, we've got a God who can actually bring worldwide change. He can change everything. He can change the lot of so many of these people who are born into slavery. I remember growing up, um, so my, uh, my mother, uh, her, name is, uh, her, her maiden name was Waldron. And uh, Waldron, uh, so her name's Eslyn Waldron, and her, her, her name was a slave name. And we, we used to talk about this in terms of, like, so close in my own history were people who had slave names. And what the slave masters used to do is they would take the slaves from wherever they took them, um, whether it was the West Indies or whether it was Africa, and then they would remove their heritage name and give them uh, a, a, an English name to, uh, to, 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 to demoralise them and to to make them less of who they were. And growing up in that, and we used to, my dad used to love um, the Negro spirituals. And on a Sunday morning, every morning, my mum used to do liver and bacon with fresh bread for breakfast. And we used to have the Negro spirituals going, you know, go down Moses, deep down in Israel land, uh, Egypt land, tell O Pharaoh to let my people go. And we grew up on this understanding that we have our freedom that we have. So for us, as a, a, a black ethnic family, the freedom that we have is amazing. But yet, I didn't clock necessarily growing up that, yes, we've got freedom, but there is a whole swathe of other people who are now bond slaves in our time. There was a, 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 um, an article on Facebook about um, how many people around the world take um, helps, who will help out in their house. And then they, when they, they arrive, they take their passports. So they, and this happens loads and loads. Um, where they're working with families, their passports are taken away. And they're made bond slaves, essentially. And it's happening now on our doorstep in our area. And it just shows how relevant the Bible is about raising the issues um, of today um, to us. So Joseph, he's there in Egypt. And he rises to 
the second most important person in the land. And then what happens again? The same thing that happened to Abram happens to Joseph. There is, um, to Joseph's family, there is a famine. There's a famine in Israel and um, Joseph's brothers travel to Egypt to get grain. And Egypt again, although it was a place of oppression for Joseph to start with, Egypt then becomes a place of hope for his family, for his brothers and his father. And they travel to Egypt and the, the, story, the story goes backwards and forwards. He's reunited uh, with, his, with, his, uh, with his family. And you see how God orchestrated all of this because he had promised Abraham and Sarah long ago that their descendants would be as, uh, as numerous as the sands on the seas. And they're about to die from starvation over there, but he brings them in. And it's quite clever what they did. They came in. Egyptians hated shepherds. They said, we're shepherds. Um, and Joseph um, places his family uh, in, in a land called the land of Goshen, which is where the shepherds were. It was a green and fertile land. And all of a sudden, God's people start to multiply in this land. And then we get to um, Exodus. So imagine, so these, this, this, this land, the, the, the people of God, the Israelites, they're, they're multiplying and they're, they're becoming a, a, a big nation. And we get to Exodus 1, um, 8 uh, to 13. Uh, now there arose a new king. So Joseph has died, obviously, um, because the, 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 this is like expanding. Now there became a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So the, the, Israelites, um, the Israelites, the Egyptians were taking, uh, had, had, had Joseph and his family, and they had the Jews there, or the, 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 the Semites. They had them there, and um, the, the Egyptians, if you look in Egyptian history, you know, we know about the pyramids, and we know about all of the great architectural feats that they created, and the cities that they created. So they used labor quite a lot. So they had this great idea. Therefore, they set them as taskmasters to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, um, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other Pua, <laughs> um, <laughs> when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. So all of a sudden, and let's just think about this, all of a sudden, the Egyptians are now going to kill every baby boy that comes. Does that sound like another story? Yeah? So the Egyptians are going to kill every baby boy. Now there are these three women, yeah? These three women who are instrumental in saving the, uh, the Israelite people. Um, jockey bed. So any student who's going to get married and is thinking about a name for their child, jockey bed's a winner, okay? Um, there's jockey bed, there's Miriam, and there's Pharaoh's daughter. So um, Jochebed uh, was Moses' mother. She realises that um, Moses is in threat of death. So her and Miriam, who's Moses' sister, they conjure this plan to put Moses in a basket and to put him on the river, and um, on the Nile, and it just so happens that Pharaoh's daughter is bathing. She sees the baby. She decides to save the baby. Moses grows to live in the palace. And you start to see how God is again using Egypt. You know, so this place of oppression, they're killing the babies, and then all of a sudden, God flips it into a place of hope, where actually, through this hope, there is going to be hope for the Israelite people, even though they didn't know it was going to be a place of hope. And you've got these three women who actually are so, we've not really spoken about, we don't really hear about how um, Jochebed, Miriam, and Moses, uh, and Pharaoh's daughter actually worked together without knowing, it, without knowing what was going to go on. But they actually did this, and therefore Moses gets to live and grow up in the palace uh, in Egypt. And then, uh, and then Moses uh, sees his people being oppressed and we see that he strikes an Egyptian and he ends up going into exile and then God speaks to Moses and God sends Moses back to Egypt. Now Egypt is like the strongest place at this time. You know, they are a strong nation, they're a wise nation, they are an, a, a, a real army. When you look in the history books, 
um, they talk about the, um, uh, the, the plaques and things where the Egyptians had conquered all of these nations and even where they talk about conquering um, the Israelites. So you've got the, you've got the Egyptians and then you, we see that Moses is told to go to the Egyptians and then we see this fight break out. The biggest fight perhaps in history between the gods of the Egyptians and between the one true God. Yeah? So the, 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 the Egypt is this superpower at this time. They believe in all of these, these gods, Imhotep, um, they, they've got all of the Geb, they've got all of these gods which all um, mean different things. And all of the plagues actually are ways that God demolishes the gods of Egypt. Won't go into all of the plagues, but th- this, this, the battle in the plagues is more than just the plagues in is- e- Egypt. Each plague represents a god that the Egyptians actually worshipped and God comes in and he breaks it all down. So the first three are about life and death. The second three are about liberty and defeat. And the third three are a, a, a fight between light and darkness. And like we heard in the story of Abraham, God delivers Israel via a plague. And we see that... Um, The people of Israel are delivered and come out of Egypt. So it's this this place of oppression, this place where for 400 years they work seven days a week. 400 years. They were there working, striving, being killed, being beaten, and they come out of Egypt. It gives you an idea why Sabbath was so important to the Israelites when you've had to work and be beaten for seven days a week. Sabbath becomes really important. And we see again um, how interesting it is. So this is the, the, this is the most exciting and the craziest deliverance of a nation that we have in Scripture. We see them coming out of, uh, out of Israel. And then we see later on in the, in the prophets where Micah says, For I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So here we have the three leaders of the greatest victory against the greatest nation are two guys and a woman, yeah? Who have now led this, 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 this nation of a million Israelites or plus who came out of Egypt and they go into the wilderness. And they're in the wilderness for 40, they've escaped Egypt and they're in the wilderness for 40 years before they go into the promise that God has given them. And this is a really interesting point, just in terms of application. They were oppressed in Egypt. And God saves them from their oppression, but they still wander, wander as in wander around, until they experience the promise God has for them. And in reading this and really studying this, kind of like there's so many things in like our life when I think about how God has used situations. So... When we came to Bristol and we ended up in a church which was really bad for us, and when we came out, we were rescued from one place and we thought, we're out, we're free. But we ended up in this place of wandering before we ended up in where we believed that God was leading us to. Like, we love being at Life Church and we feel fulfilled and we feel that God has just done amazing things. But so often for us, sometimes when there is a situation in our lives, when we have a difficulty, when we have a struggle, a trial, God often will r- r- release us from that trial, but there's still stuff that God does with us out of the trial in order to lead us to where he wants to make us useful. So they needed to get out of the land of Egypt. They needed to experience moving from bondage to moving to trust. And what we see is that as soon as they come out of, of, of Egypt, they still don't trust God. They're still complaining about that we're going to die in the wilderness, we're going to die in the wilderness. They complain, they complain, and there was this process of them learning to trust. And God so often uses this to teach us trust. He takes us into what is a wilderness after we've we've escaped from a situation in order to experience trust. And then we've got this period that they they get to the... they, they, they they they, They wander... And, um, and then they were able to go into the promised land um, with Joshua and Caleb. And uh, then we've got this uh, process or this, this time where there are lots of prophets and there's different prophecies talking about Egypt. And one of the prophecies is, uh, uh, when I was a child, I loved him in Hosea 11.1. 1, and out of Egypt, I called my son. And then there are others which talk about Egypt being um, a, a place of evil. 
And then we move towards the New Testament, where all of this is going to be sort of pulled together and fulfilled. And we get to Matthew 2 and verse 13. So um, Jesus has come. He's been born in a manger um, or in, in a stable. And we see that um, God comes in a, in, in a, a dream. Uh, Matthew 2, 13 to 15. Now when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So that's Joseph and Mary that departed. Rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. And he rose, this is Joseph, took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So Jesus, in, Jesus ties all of this together. So Jesus then is taken to Egypt. Egypt again now has become a place where they're going to be saved from death. So Abraham is going to die of starvation, goes to Egypt to survive starvation. Joseph's family are going to die of starvation, go to Egypt to uh, be saved from starvation. Then we have Jesus, death from Herod, goes to Egypt so that he is saved from ultimate death and then comes back into his ministry. But what is really interesting, as Jesus comes out into his ministry, we see that he, um, he's about to start his ministry and he gets baptised in the Jordan and then he goes into 40 days of being in the wilderness. Do you get this? Of being in the wilderness before he ends up starting the work which God called him to do. The Israelites, 40 years in the wilderness before moving into the promise that God had for them. Us, often we come out of somewhere and we go into a wilderness before God uses us and puts us into the promise that he has given and Egypt is so significant throughout Scripture as showing us how God works and why he works in certain ways and how he works in us before he works through us. And then we see that, um, that Jesus starts his, um, he starts his ministry. And then he's tying all of this together. So towards the end of his ministry, they have the Passover. And the Passover goes back to where um, the, uh, the Israelites were saved from the Egyptians, where the blood of a lamb, a lamb had to be killed and the blood had to be painted on the doorpost, and there was this sacrificial lamb that was a symbol of them being saved. And then Jesus is called the New Testament lamb that had to be sacrificed so that we could all be free. Now, when you sort of read the history books, one thing that's really interesting is that we think about the, um, the atonement um, in terms of uh, Christ dying for our sins, in our place for our sake. The early church often thought about it in terms of this idea of Christus Victor, which is the idea that there was a lot of demon possession and a lot of the, the, a battle with the war and the, and the devil and evil. And Jesus' death was that victory over the death, uh, over the, the, the realms of, the, of evil, just like the, um, the, 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 as, Mo, as um, Moses fought with the... Uh, uh, with, with Pharaoh and with the priest and there was this battle over evil and it's like Jesus' death once and for all did that. But here's an application just to think about, right? What do we call people who leave and run from their land because of threat of death? Refugees, yeah? Let's flip this. So if we look at who Jesus was and look at how we view refugees, do we view refugees like we view Jesus? It's really interesting when you start to see it in the passage. Jesus fled from a land. He was a refugee in a land that wasn't his own, away from his family, under the threat of death. And therefore, us knowing about Jesus, we, 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 he's our saviour. We know what God was doing there. Yet sometimes the way that, I suppose, media portrays refugees, sometimes the way that, you know, um, the, 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 the Syrian crisis was spoken about, we don't have that same compassion, that same feeling of love and desire to help those as we would have for thinking through the story of Jesus. And I think as we think about that, people who haven't got homes also are the homeless as well, aren't they? And I think as a church, as we think through what we do in Scripture, the Bible says, as much as you do it as unto one of these, you do it, you're doing it unto me. That is the story of what Jesus uh, is teaching us. So as we think through the scripture, we think about slavery. 
And we think about this, 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 this nation called Egypt, which, which stands as, a, uh, as, a, as an example of hope, but also stands as an example of oppression. We need to think in our everyday lives, where, about, where is there hope and where is there, uh, where is there oppression? And so often, we don't look at our trials in terms of, I'm going through a trial and this trial is oppressing me. Whether it is a financial trial, whether it's a marital trial, whether it's a, a relational trial, we don't look and say, right, okay, I can see this trial, but Lord, show me where the hope is in this trial. But the story of Egypt, the story of Egypt and how these different characters in the Bible interacted with Egypt shows us that every trial, every burden, every oppression that we face, God can show, God can reveal to us where there is hope in our trials. Where he is working in our trials to change us and to change situations. One of the interesting things is like Pharaoh oppressing the Israelites in Egypt did not take God by surprise. He had a plan. He knew what he was going to do. He knew that he had brought Joseph in and that, um, that Moses was in the palace for a reason. And sometimes when we experience a trial, we wrestle with God and we say, how long, O oh Lord? How long? Or why? Why, O oh Lord? Why, why is this happening to me? Why is it happening to me? What's going on? And we feel sometimes like God doesn't seem to be in control. But nothing, absolutely nothing, takes God by surprise. The Egyptians saw God's blessing on the Israelites. And um, the Israelites went from Joseph's family in the land of Goshen to this massive nation. And the, Israelites got, uh, the, the Egyptians got jealous that this nation were going to overrun them and join with other enemies and fight them. In life, when God is working in us, he's working through us and we're experiencing his blessing, do not be surprised if jealousy, persecution and hardship comes. It is par for the course. We can see this in scripture. The key thing for us is to understand that God works in all of these ways and God knows nothing is taking him by surprise. And also in all of these stories, in all of these stories that we see through the Bible, as we see as these different characters interact with Egypt, God is glorified. God is glorified. They go in, they, they're taken into situations where there is no way out apart from a miracle. And God is glorified every single time. Glorified through Abraham, glorified through Joseph, glorified through his son. In our situations, if we are believers and we are adopted by God, every situation we find ourselves in, God will glorify himself through those situations. And if we have that posture to hardship, if we have that posture towards difficulty, it reframes the picture of how we look at how our lives are panning out. It reframes what's going on because the whole the issue of Israel being in the wilderness was about trust. We reframe it and we realize that through trust we can continue, through trust we can live, through Christ who strengthens us, we can reframe the pictures of the situations that we're in. Think about this. Like, if we think today, what is the fastest growing church in the world? It's disputed, isn't it? It could either be the African church or the Chinese church. Let's take Chinese church. They are under, or have been under, unbelievable persecution. Unbelievable persecution. But it has gone from a few house churches to millions and millions of people following Jesus Christ, changing their communities, changing their workplaces, and changing a nation, which for all intents and purposes was like a strong communist, like, for Jesus for his glory. Um, you go back, I don't know if any of you read Pilgrim's Progress, but um, uh, John Bunyan um, got saved and he was proclaiming the gospel. This is going back centuries. Um, and uh, he was put in prison and he wrote this book. Whilst he's in prison, God gave him a dream and he wrote his dream down. And I think it's like one of the, it's like this, one of the second most read books ever. 
um, Pilgrim's Progress, which is the story of it. It's, it's amazing. It's kind of like the Lord of the Rings um, uh, kind of Christian journey um, through different things in life. But God, through him being in prison, brought so many people to Christ. Um, in South Korea, uh, the Koreans, the Korean church is growing at a rate of knots. The, the church grew from one of the missionaries, I forget his name, one of the missionaries who went there, um, he was killed, uh, by the, um, killed by the Koreans. And as he, was, as he was shot dead, he was throwing Bibles onto the banks. And someone papered the inside of the house, wallpapered the inside of the house with these, have you heard this story? With, these, with the pages of the Bible. And they ended up reading something that was on the page of the Bible, got saved, and revival broke out. Out of a situation where someone's been killed, a missionary has been killed for the glory of God. And you just start to see that in all of our situations, sometimes on the face of it, we don't know why God allowed us to get in this situation. We don't know where we're going in our lives. We're trying to work it all out. But if we reframe it and see that God does all things, all things work together for good, for those that love God, for those that are called according to his purpose. That is what God does for us. So I kind of think that as we go into Christmas, for some of us, Christmas is just going to be just a wonderful, thing, wonderful time of all family being together and it's going to be hunky-dory. For others of us, we've got difficult relationships to try and navigate uh, during the time in Christmas. And sometimes there's a lot of sadness around what Christmas could have been and what Christmas is. But I kind of think this morning just to think that as much as the situations are hard and we, we can't always change those situations and we can't change the hardship and the sadness of what Christmas is, but if we reframe it and just realise that there is a good God, God is good, and we live in a fallen world where we're going to have fallen relationships, where we're going to have lost loved ones, where we're going to have difficult um, times or where perhaps there's going to be loneliness. But we have a God who has shown us time and time again, if you trust me, if you trust me, if you lean into me, I will be your rock of ages, just like I was for Abraham, just like I was for Jacob and for Joseph, just like I was for Moses and the Israelites, just like I was for my son, Jesus. And if there's one takeaway um, that we take from the whole issue of Israel, is that, uh, of, of Egypt, is that as much as there is oppression and there is trial, we should look for hope. Like we are the people who gossip hope. When all was lost, Jesus came in. He did it time and time and time again. And he will do it time and time and time again. Shall we pray? Oh, Father God, we just thank you for your word. And we thank you for the ways in which your word just shows us just how you work and how you've just come into so many situations and the, the ways in which you've led in so many ways. And we just thank you for the story of Egypt and how we see, um, we see oppression and trial and we see hope. And we thank you that you are the God of hope. You are the God of hope for today, hope for tomorrow and hope for the future. We thank you that you are the God who we can rely on and that we know that one day you will come again and that you will take us and that there will be a day when that there is no more sadness, no more trials, but we get to worship and live with you in heaven. We thank you, Father God, that you are the one that we can lean on. We thank you that you are called the Rock of Ages. We thank you that you are called Je Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We thank you that you are our healer. We thank you that you are our leader and that you are our guide. And Lord, even this morning, we just pray, Father God, that we would be able to not only see hope, but we would be able to share hope. Sharing hope with all of those people we meet. Sharing hope with our family. Sharing hope with our work colleagues. Sharing hope with the people that we meet. And that we, people would know us um, for the hope that is within us. Your word says that we would be able to give people a reason for the hope that is within us. But may we, first of all, have that hope that you have shown us through scripture so that we can give people a reason that we are loved, that we are chosen, that we are special, and that we are yours. In Jesus' name, amen.